in what we were just talking about. And our very last thing that we talked about was the relationship that is very similar from the Spirit to Jesus that Jesus has to the Father, right? The Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And so from this passage, as well as Revelation 19, we get this idea that Jesus is called the Word of God. Are we comfortable with that, everyone? He's the Logos. He's the Word of God. And so that is one way to describe the relationship between the Father, who superintends the Godhead, and the Son. The Father and the Son. The Son is the Word of the Father. But Jesus, speaking of another comforter that would come, another comforter, right? He says that he would not speak his own words, but he would bring to remembrance and recollection his words. That he would glorify him and that he would bring all things to remembrance that Jesus had spoken. And so here, Jesus, who also said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. We find that it's as if the word of Jesus is the spirit. So the word of the Father is the Son, and the word of the Son is the Spirit. Each one, as we discussed in our last session, deferring to the other. The Son pointing the direction and the spotlight to, or the Father pointing the direction and the spotlight to the Son. The Son saying, no, 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 it's about the Father. And the Spirit saying, no, it's about the Son, to which the Son replies, no, it's the Father. There's this humility within the Godhead. Amen? Now, we, we spent a fairly significant amount of time in John chapter 14, and we noted several things. First of all, that Jesus attributes elements and activities to the Spirit that only a person could do. He will guide, he will teach, he will instruct, he will reveal. That's the kind of thing that a person does, number one. Number two, he refers to him with the masculine pronoun, he. What's the pronoun, everyone? He, okay? And the third thing that I thought was quite fascinating is that Jesus says, I will send you another comforter another comforter. Now, you remember the illustration with me and JD and uh, uh, Shelly as we're eating lunch. I request another, do you remember what it was? Sandwich. What do you know by definition? There was a first sandwich. So if Jesus is saying, I'll give you another comforter, the question is, who was the first comforter? Who was the first one that the word literally means parakletos, ones that stands beside? Who was the first one that stood beside the disciples? Jesus. And he says, I'm going away, but I will send you another person to stand beside you. Remember the illustration with the contractor, right? I've got the job halfway done, the addition on your house. I'm leaving, but I will send you another contractor. And only a person could take the place left vacant by a person. Does that make sense? In what sense could electricity or gravity or electromagnetism take the place that was left vacant by a person? Can't be. Jesus is referred to as the parakletos in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, where he says, My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, a parakletos with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So when Jesus then says, I'm going to send you another person to stand beside you, another parakletos, they're looking for a person. Now, I need to say something here. We sometimes mistakenly assume that personhood means physicality. Right? We, we think, oh, person toes and feet and knees and legs and, and a body. No, 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 no. Personhood is not necessarily tied to physicality. I've had people actually say to me, well, David, that doesn't make any sense. How can the Holy Spirit be a person? The Holy Spirit's a spirit. I said, well, wait a minute. I didn't say the Holy Spirit was a human. I said the Holy Spirit was a person. By the way, if we have a problem with the Holy Spirit being a person, remember what Jesus said to the woman that was, when he was sitting there at the well? He said, God is a spirit. So if God is a spirit, is God a person? Yes or no? Okay, so the Father is a spirit. By the way, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you might want to just note, make note of that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that Jesus is a spirit. He calls him a quickening spirit. And so look at what you have. The Holy Spirit, obviously a spirit. God the Father, spirit. Jesus, spirit. So this idea of personhood, when we talk about the Holy Spirit as a person, what we're saying is this. The Holy Spirit possesses, volition, he possess, possesses volitionality. He possesses personality. He possesses a will. He possesses intelligence, etc. And we're going to see that right now. Personhood is not necessarily tied to physicality. And there's many ways to demonstrate this. I'll just give you a very quick one here. If I was involved in a car accident, heaven forbid, and I had to have my right arm removed, okay, like that, so I, was amp I became an amputee, am I now less of a person now that I've had my arm removed? Am I less of a person? Is that how we treat amputees? We say, oh, well, he's only half a person. 
No, there's still people. Now, what if I lost my other arm in, a, in an accident? Am I less a person now than I was before? Say, oh, well, David used to be a person, but now he's half a person. No, 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 no. The reality is, is that my personhood is tied to my individuality, my identity, my character, my volition, my will, my memory, my hopes, my dreams, etc. It's not tied to my fingers, my arm, my legs. So personhood is not absolutely tied to physicality. When we say that the Holy Spirit is a person, we're simply saying that he possesses volition, that he possesses intentionality, that he possesses intelligence, that he possesses a will, etc. So far so good, everyone? Now, with that sort of in mind, what I'd like to do at this point is just read a great statement here, sort of a cautioning statement as we commence from a great book called Acts of the Apostles, pages 51 and 52. This is a, a nice little caution as we commence with our fifth and final presentation here. It says, it is not essential for us to be able to, to define just what the Holy Spirit is. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them men having fanciful views may bring together passages of scripture and put a human construction on them but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church regarding such mysteries which are too deep for human what understanding silence is golden okay this is a great caution statement for us, cautionary statement for us, because what it basically does is it takes us right up to the edge of that sea and it says, here's what you can know, and beyond what you can know, don't make conjectures. Don't guess. Don't put out idle theories or idle ideas or, or uh, imaginings of what the Spirit is. No. What we know about the Spirit is that He is a person. We're going to see that in just a second. That He is God. We're going to see that in just a second. But to try and figure out precisely what His ontology is. That ontology means His being. What exactly is He? Does He have a shape? Does He have a form? We should only affirm what Scripture says and not try to conjecture and imagine on what Scripture does not say. Are you with me on that? The church is not benefited by that. The Spirit is a mystery. Now that shouldn't come as too much of a surprise to us because as we've already seen, God Himself is a mystery. Amen? I mean, we saw that. Without controversy, 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, without controversy, some translations say, by common confession, great is the what? Mystery of godliness. So it should not strike us at all as at all surprising that that the Spirit is mysterious because God is mysterious and Jesus is mysterious and the Incarnation is mysterious and it's a mystery. Now, can we know some things about God? Yes or no? Yeah, the things that He has revealed. This is precisely how, by the way, the unknown God becomes the known God. The unknown God becomes the known God to us when we see what He has revealed about Himself. This is the way I like to say it. If God decided to play hide-and-seek... You couldn't find him. If God just decided that he was going to make himself perfectly, ineffably, impenetrably known. In other words, you could not access him. You would, have, you would know nothing about him. The only thing that we know about God is what he himself has disclosed to us in scripture and in the created order. Are you with me on that? So we're going to stand on those things right here on the edge of the seashore. And we're going to rejoice in all of what we do know. Amen? Amen? And we're not going to conjecture about what we don't know. One final word. When we talk about the things that we don't know about God, all of that seashore that's out there, please understand very, very um, distinctly that what we are talking about is God's nature. It's God's nature that is unknown to us. God's character is very well known to us. That has been disclosed in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So when we talk about God... We know a great deal about his character. Amen? God is love. For God so loved the world, etc., etc. It's his nature that we should all, we should sort of come up to that question of the nature of God. We should take off our shoes and we should say we're standing on holy ground. Because of the limits of human language and the limits of human intellect, we really are only babbling like babies when we're doing our very best. But when it comes to the character of God, we know exactly what the character of God is like because Jesus came and revealed to us who God is. Amen? Okay, now with that in mind, go with me to the book of Acts. Let's spend some time in the book of Acts. You might be saying, okay, why the book of Acts? Simple. I'm going to say this and I think you'll get it here. 
Pentecost is to the Holy Spirit what Bethlehem was to Jesus. You got that? Pentecost is to the Holy Spirit what Bethlehem was to Jesus. If you were to pick up the biography of the life of Christ, say you were to walk up and there was a biography on the life of Christ, where likely would that biography begin? Well, where does Matthew, Mark, all the synoptics begin this way. Matthew, Mark, Luke all begin this way. John begins even further back. In the beginning was the word. He goes back. But, but for the most part, a biography on the life of Christ is going to start right where the synoptics start. They're going to start in and around Bethlehem's manger. Are you with? That just makes sense. If you were going to write a biography on David Asherick, it would begin in Cheyenne, Wyoming, August 16th, 1972. So too with the Spirit. Somebody says, well, there's the Spirit in the Old Testament, and yes, the Spirit is there, but the Spirit is far more common and far more frequently spoken of and more explicitly spoken of in the New Testament and it really begins on the day of Pentecost and so I'll say it again what Bethlehem was to Jesus Pentecost was to the Spirit in fact when you actually go through the whole Old Testament the word Spirit occurs just 88 times 88 times in the Old Testament is the word Spirit right the Hebrew equivalent Ruach and when you come to the New Testament, which is about one-third to one-quarter as long, the word spirit occurs 262 times, right? So roughly four to, three to four times as often in a book that's three to four times as small, or a, a section that's three to four times as small. So basically what you have is the spirit is spoken of ten times more often in the New Testament than in the Old Testament. The reason for that is, is that it was at Pentecost, and this is fascinating by the way, it was at Pentecost that the Holy Spirit came in all of his fullness. In all of his, what word did I say everyone? Now this is awesome. The Jews believed, and you can make a reasonable biblical case for this as well, the Jews believed that the law was given from Mount Sinai's summit when God wrote the, on, on tablets of stone with his own finger. Do you know what day they say that happened? Pentecost, right? The Jews believed that it was on the day of Pentecost that the law was given on Sinai, right? It's very interesting. Now think this through. If that's accurate, and I think it is incidentally, if that's accurate, look at what happens on the day of Pentecost in the New Testament, Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit comes on the day of Pentecost, and his primary purpose, we'll talk about this in just a bit, is to write his law, the law of God, not on cold tables of stone, but on the fleshly tables of our heart. So you can make a very powerful similarity here between Pentecost in the Old Testament where the law was given and Pentecost in the New Testament where the Spirit is given who writes his law upon our hearts. Are you with me on that? Awesome stuff. Absolutely awesome. Now, when we go to the book of Acts, which in many ways is to the Spirit, it's the actions of the Spirit. It's the acts of the Spirit through the church Acts is to the Spirit what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are to Jesus. This is the story of the Spirit. And when we get there, we're just going to start in Acts chapter 5. And we'll start here in, in verse 1. We've, we've just mentioned here Acts chapter 2, but I kind of want to walk through several passages here, and I want to get all of this data in. So we're going to move, not fast, but we will move probably swiftly. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, it says, But a certain man named, what's his name, everyone? Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart, now watch this, to lie to the who? To lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Uh, why have you conceived this thing in your heart? Now look at this. You have not lied to men, but to who? You have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. So in, in one verse, Peter says, in, in one uh, section here, he says, you have lied to the Spirit, and then immediately after that, he says, you've lied to what? To God. What does this tell us about the Spirit? If you've lied to the Spirit, and you've lied to God, what is the Spirit? Yeah, the most reasonable conclusion that you would come to based on this passage is that the Spirit is God. Peter understood this. It was coming clear to him now after the day of Pentecost when Jesus had said, I will send you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of my Father whom I will send from him. So they go to Jerusalem and they're waiting. 
They didn't fully understand exactly what was going to come. Who knows? Maybe they thought another person was going to come walking in the door and say, hey guys, I'm here. I'm the but that's not what happened on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came down. It wasn't just a power. It wasn't just a force. It wasn't just an effervescence or an electromagnetism. What came down, and they recognized it, was the third person of the Godhead. This was God himself who was coming, not cumbered with humanity, but in all the fullness, who lived not just beside them as Jesus had. He had walked with them, he had talked with them, he had spent time with them, but the Spirit actually came inside of them, and they recognized this is God in the flesh. This is God's representative on earth. In fact, just a statement on that, fascinating here. This is another one from, um, another great statement here, Desire of Ages, page 671. Listen to this. Speaking of this very moment, this very event, the power of evil had been strengthening for centuries and the submission of men to this satanic captivity was amazing. Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the, I want you to say these words with me here, of the third person of the Godhead who would come with no modified energy but in the fullness of divine power. It is the spirit that makes effectual what has been wrought out by the world's redeemer. Now friends, I only speak one language and that's the English language. Okay? They say that if you can speak three languages, you're trilingual, two languages, you're bilingual, and one language, you're white and you're from the United States. So that's me, one language. I've only got one. So, so if, if I can't get it right with this language, I'm stuck. I can't resort to my Spanish or resort to my Romanian or to my Swahili. This, this is the only arrow in my quiver is English. Are you with me on that? If language means anything, third person means third person. Are you with me on that? I mean, if, if language has meaning, third as in one, two, three, Okay, well who would the first two be? God the Father, God the Son, and then now what? God the, God the Spirit, okay? So here we have third and then person. Is God the Father a person? Okay, is Jesus a person? So what's the Holy Spirit? A person. So this is, I just want to rewind here briefly. When we started back in Genesis 1, four sessions ago, we said that the Old Testament is suggestive. The Old Testament is what, everyone? There's hints, there's allusions, there's suggestions. We went to Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3, Genesis 11, Genesis 18 and 19. We went to Isaiah 6, Isaiah 9, Numbers 6, and Deuteronomy 6. All of these passages suggest. Then we get to the New Testament, and what was implicit in the Old Testament becomes increasingly explicit in the New Testament, where Jesus says, I and my Father are what? One. So what we see is a progressive revelation. You might remember that, the pulling back of the cloth to progressively reveal. But by the time we come down here, by the time we get here to Desire of Ages, page 671, I mean, the language is just unmistakably clear. The third person of the Godhead. So what was suggestive and became increasingly clear becomes explicitly, in fact, I don't want to be polemical here, but I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say it becomes unmistakably clear. Third person of the Godhead. Now I have met many well-meaning and well-intentioned people who say, no, 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 no. There's no Trinity. There's no, that's just a pagan Catholic, you know. Well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Forgive me, forgive me for my naivete, but third person of the Godhead. If I stand before the throne of God and he says, oh, you got that Trinity thing all wrong. How could you possibly believe that? I could say, well, I, I guess I was confused by that one phrase there, third person of the Godhead. You tracking with me? We serve a very reasonable God who is very good at communicating his, his ways. Amen? I mean, he's not going to say third person when he really means there's only one. It just doesn't, it doesn't add up. Are you tracking with me? Third person. Now, the great thing about this is, is that in its larger theological context... That's exactly what we need. We don't just need a force. We don't just need a power. We don't just need a, an effervescence. We need God himself to come into us to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And that's the second part of the statement there, that it is the job of the Spirit to make effectual what had been wrought by the world's Redeemer. So when Peter said, you've not lied to men, you've lied to the parakletos. You've lied to the one that Jesus sent. You have lied to to God himself. Now, we're going to stay in the book of Acts and go with me to Acts chapter 15. Stay in the book of Acts 
Acts chapter 15. Very quickly here, this is the burgeoning, blossoming New Testament church. And they're all in a uh, confused kerfuffle about how to relate to the Gentiles who are coming in to the church. And they don't know what to do. And so they get together and they pray and they wrestle and they struggle and then they write a letter and I want you to hear part of this letter that they write. It's in verse 28. Actually, we'll pick it up in verse 27. This is the church writing, sending this letter with Paul and Barnabas. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas who will also report the same things by word of mouth. Verse 28. For it seemed good to who? It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. So think about that. The church is saying, hey, we thought this was a good idea, and so did the Spirit. Well, the only kind of being that can think and have good ideas and imagine and, and have opinions and perspectives is a person. Right? I can't say, hey, piano, what did you think about that last song they played on you? You weren't feeling that, were you? Come on, don't be so quiet. Don't be bashful. Go ahead. It seemed good to me and to the piano. No. The moment you say it seemed good to the Spirit, you are attributing personhood to the Spirit. It seemed good to the Spirit and to us. The church recognizes that the Spirit is not just a power or an energy. The Spirit is a person. Now stay in Acts and look at chapter 16. Acts chapter 16, verse 6. It says, Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. So the Holy Spirit forbids. Don't do that. Verse 7. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit did not, what? Permit them. So, not only does it seem good to us and to the Spirit, but the Spirit also forbids and the Spirit permits. These are the kinds of activities and characteristics that are attributable only to a person. Now, we're going to leave the book of Acts. We may come back, but go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is one of the lists of the spiritual gifts that we find in Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm going to read here in verse 1. We've already looked at the triadic passage over there in verses 4, 5, and 6. The same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God. And now look at verse 11 of 1 Corinthians 12. It says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. So notice what the Spirit does here. The Spirit distributes, okay, this is, this is the kind of activity that you would expect of a person. Not only does he distribute, but Paul says that the Spirit distributes the gifts to the church according as he what? According as he wills. And this is what we were just talking about a moment ago when we said that personhood is not tied to physicality. Personhood is tied to volitionality. It's tied to the, the possession of will and, and intention. And so it says here that the Spirit gives the gifts to who He wills. And in the context of 1 Corinthians, it's because the Corinthians thought, oh, well, I'll get this gift, and I'll get this gift, and I'll be a prophet, and I'll be a healer, and I'll speak in tongues. And Paul says, no, 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 no. You don't make those decisions. It's the Spirit who gives the gifts to whomever He wants to give them to. Are you with me on that? So the Spirit possesses will. Quite obviously, this is the very kind of thing that a person would do. The Spirit possesses intentionality. Now, let's go to Luke, back to the Gospels, chapter 12, and find another activity that's attributed to the Spirit that only a person could do. Luke chapter 12, this is an easy one to remember because it's verse 12, Luke 12, 12. It says, for the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Okay, who will teach us? The Holy Spirit. This is exactly what Jesus has said in John 14, 15, and 16. He will teach, he will guide, he will reveal. The Holy Spirit himself will teach you. Notice all of these activities are being attributed to the Spirit as if he's a person. Well, why? Because he is a person. Amen? Not just a power, not just... Some force, not like Star Wars, may the force be with you. No, may the, may the third person of the Godhead, the parakletos that Jesus spoke of, may he be with you, beside you, and inside of you. 
Now here's where things get very interesting. The Holy Spirit can be grieved. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. Ephesians 4.30, notice this one. It says, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Don't grieve the Spirit. Person, uh, friends, I have a question. Can you grieve, could I grieve this pulpit? No, could I grieve this piano? You know, I, I mean, I, maybe I could. <laughs> if I sat down, I'd do my best. But the point is, is that even somebody who can't play, somebody like me, who's got thumbs on all this, on, on where there should be fingers, I can't grieve a piano. I can't grieve a speaker. I can't grieve a pulpit or a chair or any other inanimate thing. But can you grieve a person? Can I grieve my children? Can I grieve my wife? Can I grieve you? Impossible, right? <laughs> So when it says, don't grieve the Spirit, here again, what do we find? We find the New Testament writers consistently attributing to the Spirit the attributes and characteristics of a, what word am I going to say here? Of a person. Not only can the Spirit be grieved, according to the author of Hebrews, join me there, Hebrews 10, the Spirit can be insulted the Spirit can be insulted. And I'm going to say just a word on this here. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm reading verse 29. Hebrews 10, 29. It says, Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot and counted the blood of the covenant with which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? insulted the spirit, grieved the spirit. Now, let me just remind you of something here. In Matthew chapter 12, Jesus spoke about what we call the unpardonable what? Sin. And can you tell me, what did Jesus say the unpardonable sin was? Okay, very good. Blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Now think about that. In the context of Matthew 12, Jesus says a very interesting thing. He says, blasphemy against the Son of Man will be forgiven. Okay, now think about that. Blasphemy against the Son of Man is blasphemy against a person. Okay? And he says that can be forgiven. But blasphemy against the Spirit, he says, cannot and will not be forgiven to men. Now, think about this juxtaposition. That's just a fancy word that means setting two things side by side. Juxtaposition. Okay. Can you commit blasphemy against Jesus? Yes or no? Can you? Can it be forgiven? Okay, then the very next thing Jesus says, but the sin that cannot be forgiven is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Okay, so if this is a sin against a person, what does this sound like it is when Jesus places it in exact juxtaposition? Does that sound like it's a sin against a person? And this is what Paul is alluding to and the author of Hebrews is alluding to when they say, don't grieve the Spirit, don't insult the Spirit. Don't insult the piano, David. Don't insult that piano. Don't grieve the pulpit, David. Don't insult the speakers. No, 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 no. The only thing that can be grieved or insulted is something that possesses emotion, intelligence, will, and volition. That is to say, personhood. Are you tracking with me on that? Does that make sense? Is this making sense? It's just clear as can be. Well, not only can the Holy Spirit be grieved and insulted, the Holy Spirit loves. Come with me to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I love this particular one here. Romans chapter 15, notice with me verse 30. Romans 15 says, verse 30, Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ and through the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in prayers to God for me. The love of the Spirit. The word of in the English usually functions in what we would call the possessive, right? If we say, for example, he is a man of talent, we mean that he's a man that possesses talent. If we say she's a woman of wealth, we mean that she's a woman that possesses wealth. The word of functions as a possessive. So here when it says the love of the spirit, it means the spirit has love. 
This is very similar to what is uh, communicated in a blessing that we've already read, the, the apostolic benediction, where it speaks about the, this is 2 Corinthians 13, 14, where it speaks about the fellowship of the Spirit, the love of the Spirit. Now that makes sense, because if someone can be insulted, and someone can be grieved, and someone can be blasphemed and sinned against, that must be someone that loves. That must be someone who has extended his hand only to have that hand rejected. And who has extended his hand only to have that hand rejected. And who has extended his hand only to have that hand rejected again and again. We don't talk about the love of the piano or the love of the pulpit or the love of your car. Only a person can be grieved and insulted and only a person can genuinely love. No wonder John would say in just a few uh, short books uh, away from this, God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is, what's our word? God is love. Now I want to take you to my two favorites um, when it comes to this, and they're both in the book of Romans. You're already there, so go to Romans chapter 8. To me, if, if all we had, if all we had on this subject was these passages, we would have enough. If all we had were these passages, we would have enough. And the first is Romans chapter 8. Beginning in verse 26. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought to, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Two major things here. First of all, is it clear to you that according to this passage that the Spirit intercedes? Okay, now, now wait a minute. We've got to think that one through. What does the word intercede mean? Give me some synonyms for intercede. Okay, stand in for... Okay, anybody, uh, nice and loud? Okay, what is that? Go between, very good. Anybody else? Mediate, very good. Okay, you're, you got it. Now, let's take the one there. Go between. Go between. Okay, go between what? Ah, exactly, two parties. Okay, now think this through very carefully here. In order to intercede, you have to have party A and party B, and then party C is interceding. Is this making sense? Now think that through. If, if Paul here says the Spirit himself intercedes for us, there's one of the parties, according to the will of God, you got your three parties right there. We, the saints, God as two of the parties right here, number one is us, number, or God you could say, number two is us, and the Spirit is making intercession. The only way that anything can intercede is if you have two other parties. See, some people say the Spirit is not an, a person in and of himself. The Spirit is just the extension of the Father. The Spirit is just the personal presence of the Son, which sounds reasonably persuasive at times, but here's the problem with it. There is a very real sense, of course, in which the Spirit is the presence of the Father and is the presence of the Son, but they say he's just the presence of the Father, just the presence of the Son. He does not possess his own individuated personhood. But here's the problem. Think about what this verse would be saying then. The Spirit, that is to say, the extension of God, intercedes between God and us. Well, wait a minute. How is God, the Father, interceding with God the Father on our behalf. You see how that's confusing? The only way you can have intercession is if you have party A, party B, and someone who is interceding between. Now on, the, on this very point here, Ellen White is just so clear and so profoundly um, encouraging. I have to share this statement with you. I think it's our final statement. This is from the first volume of the Selected Messages series, page 344. Listen to this. Christ, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding in man's behalf. Okay, I want to stop right there. Christ, our mediator, and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding on man's behalf. Okay, so does Christ intercede? Yes or no? Okay, not just intercedes, but he constantly intercedes. So Christ, and who else does she say intercedes? Christ and the... The Spirit, okay, so 
Do we need the intercession of Christ? Yeah. The intercession of Christ revolves around the pleading of his own blood. Right? And by the way, that simply means his life. The blood is the life. So, so when he pleads his blood, it means, Father, the death that I died was the death that they deserved, and the life that I have lived is the life they have not lived. I present myself to you. That's, the, that's where the intercession of Christ takes place, presenting his sacrificial death and his substitutionary life. Are you with me on that? But, but not only does Jesus intercede, the Spirit intercedes. Question. Does the Spirit present His blood? Why not? Because He didn't die. He didn't die on Golgotha's tree. So what does the Spirit do? Ah, notice as it continues. Christ our mediator and the Holy Spirit are constantly interceding in man's behalf. But the Spirit pleads, what's the next word? Not for us as does Christ who presents His blood shed from the foundation of the world. Okay. Makes sense. Next part. The Spirit works upon our hearts, drawing out prayers and penitence, praise, hallelujah, and thanksgiving. The gratitude which flows from our lips is the result of the who? Spirits striking the chords of the soul in holy memories, awakening, I love this metaphor here, the music of the heart. Okay, now this is absolutely awesome. This is exactly what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 8. That the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. In the context of Romans chapter 8, Paul has talked about the groaning creation. And he's talked about the groaning Christian. And here he talks about the groaning comforter. All, he actually says that. The, he says creation groans. And he says Christians groan. And here he says even the comforter, the Spirit groans. Well, what is the Spirit groaning? Have you ever had the experience of kneeling to pray and not even knowing what to say? This happens to me like every single time I pray. I mean, I, I, I'll just be honest with you. I'll be very vulnerable here with you, very transparent. Prayer, prayer is difficult for me. Um, I actually read Shelley's book, Pressing Into His Presence. It's very, very helpful. Um, but for me, study comes natural. Books come natural. Reading comes natural. But prayer... I'm just so philosophically and analytically minded that when I get down to pray, I think, well, God, you already know what I was going to say if I was going to pray, so can we just skip this part? But then I realized prayer is not about me giving God information. It's about me coming into connection with God, and that takes time, right? But when I kneel down and I'm like, Lord, I don't know how to pray for all the people that are sold into sexual slavery, I don't know how to pray for all the children that starve to death on a daily basis or the children in urban situations who never even get to go out of the city limits of the town in which they were born. I don't know how to pray for the situation. I don't know how to pray. And in Romans 8, we have this amazing promise that when, when you don't know how to pray, and he says it, we don't even know how to pray like we ought to. So I get down and I say, Lord, I'm going to pray. Have you ever had to pray for a sick person? Is that tough to do? Yeah, it's very difficult to pray for a sick per person because do you believe that God can heal them? Yeah. yeah, but do you know that that's what God is going to do? Uh, no. So when I kneel, when I go to do an anointing or I pray for a sick person, I'm always caught between my total faith that God can heal and yet my unawareness or my lack of, of, of knowledge about whether or not he will right now. Now God's going to heal everybody at the resurrection. Amen. So I don't know how to pray. I go into hospitals on many occasions and I'm just stumbling and bumbling and fumbling and when I pray I say Lord take this stumbling bumbling in the words of the old hymn stammering tongue and Father please will you hear what my heart is saying I don't even know if I'm praying the right way people call me all the time they say David I don't know what I should do with my life should I go to school should I do Bible work should I marry this person should I move to this country should I do me how do I know I don't know but you can kneel and you can pray and you can say Lord what do you want me to do? How do you want me to go? How, and you're praying, and you, then you can even say, and Lord, if I'm praying all messed up, please let the Spirit intercede. May the Spirit gather up those prayers. The Spirit's listening because He's a person. See, He's a person. The Spirit's listening. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Got that. He gathers up those prayers, those fragmentary prayers, and He brings them to the, he intercedes this is what he this is what he said 
I know, it's, it sounded stupid, I know. But this is what he meant. And this is what she asked for. I know, I know, she's immature, she's doing it. But this is what she meant. The Spirit himself intercedes. Well, how can the Spirit intercede? Because he's a person. And not just a person, he's God. Jesus intercedes. Jesus' intercession is equal to the Spirit's, but different. Distinguishable, but not divisible. I want to say that again. The, the intercession of the Spirit and the intercession of Jesus are distinguishable, but they're not divisible. This is what Jesus is doing. He's pleading his blood. This is what the Spirit is doing, but both are absolutely essential. You with me on that? Now, it gets even more awesome, and we stay in Romans chapter 8. This is, this is arguably my favorite verse in all of the first half of Romans chapter 8. <laughs> I love this verse. I love this verse because to me it is so epistemologically profound, but I don't have time to go into that right now. Check this out. Romans chapter 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of what? Of adoption. I can relate to that. I was adopted not once, but twice. You received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Daddy, Abba, Papa. That's what my little boys call me, Papa. Father. Verse 16. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. This is awesome. By the way, the way that we know Christianity is true, this is what I was talking about there just when I mentioned the epistemological significance of this verse. The way that we know Christianity is true is because the Spirit tells us that it's true. The way that we show it is true is by arguments and by evidence and by godly lives. But that's not how we know the Christian faith is true. We know the Christian faith is true because God's Spirit, who is himself a member of the Godhead, comes into our lives and bears witness with our spirit. And God's spirit says to our spirit, you're a son of God, you're a daughter of God. Amen? And only a person can do that. In fact, I don't have the quotation here. But Ellen White actually makes that exact point based on this verse. She makes that exact point. She says, the spirit is a person, this is a direct quote, the spirit is a person, else he could not bear witness with our spirits. Only a person. Have you ever poured your heart out to somebody and had them say, I know exactly what you mean? Yes or no? Yeah, you open your heart to somebody and they say, man, I know, I know, I feel your pain. I know where you're coming from. I've walked a mile in your moccasins. I'm with you. I'm smelling what you're cooking, right? I'm hearing what you're saying. I'm catching what you're throwing. There's a resonance there. And that's exactly what Paul says the Spirit does. The Spirit bears witness with our spirits. You're the son of God. You're the daughter of God. And we know it. Intuitively, incorrigibly is the technical term. We know in a self-authenticating way because God has revealed himself to us through his spirit. Not just a power, not just an effervescence, but the third person of the Godhead. Amen? Is that just absolutely so thrilling? Now, the final thing I want to get into here, and I have just a moment, is this. I've said this at the end of the last two sessions, and I want to unpack it a little bit. We've looked at all the things that only a person could do. We, he forbids, he permits, he teaches, he can be grieved, he can be insulted, he guides, he reveals, etc. He's a person. What's the practical application? Several years ago, I was sitting in a restaurant, and there was a, a man that uh, was not of my particular faith community, but he was a wonderful man, good Christian man. And he asked me if I'd, been, if I'd received the Holy Spirit, if I'd been anointed and I, uh, by the Spirit. And I said, I think so. And he said, oh, you don't know? Well, and we were sitting in a restaurant. He said, come out back with me, and um, I'll show you. I said, all right. I was a brand new Christian. So, went out back, and his name was Jerry, and we get behind the restaurant there, and he says, okay, well... And I was like, he's like, yeah, it's the gift of tongues. You can have it right now. Go ahead. And I was just like, what do you mean? He's like, go ahead. The spirit will come upon you. Go. And eat. I didn't know anything. Theology. I was just like, and I was just like, it just didn't pass the smell test. It just, it didn't sound right. He's like, no, it's easy. It's easy. Go, 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 go. And I was like, uh, you know, Jerry, I don't know. I'm just not, I'm, I'm not really, f I'm not feeling that. He's like, no, you can do And here's the thing. 
The reason that, and, and Jerry's a great guy, and I think he was way off on 1 Corinthians 14 and way off on Acts 2 and way off on Acts 10. I don't think that that is anything like a manifestation of the gift of the Spirit. But here's the point. Jerry acted in such a way as though the Spirit was something he could just summon and then now demonstrate and perform. We treat the Spirit like it's a power and we're in trouble. We're going to start trying to use this power. But we treat the Spirit and we relate to the Spirit as He is, as a person. Then our plea will be a very different situation. Not give me the Spirit that I may be powerful, but rather, give me the Spirit, or rather, rather, give the Spirit to me. May, may I be given to the Spirit that He may use me. Great old story about Dwight Moody. I'll close with this. He was preaching a big evangelistic meeting in Chicago, and a young minister was getting tired about hearing, Moody, Moody, Moody. He was at a minister's meeting. And so he spoke up on one occasion at the minister's meeting, and he said, all we ever hear is Moody, 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 Moody. What does this guy have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit? And one of the older ministers spoke up and said, no, you got it all wrong, young man. Dwight Moody does not have a monopoly on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's got a monopoly on Dwight Moody. And friends, that's what we need. We need the unknown God to become the known God. The Spirit, the third person of the Godhead. Not just to be beside us or next to us or over us or around us, but in keeping and in fulfillment with the promise of Jesus that the unknown God would become the known God, that His Spirit would bear witness with our spirits and that He would be in us.